I think robots will invariably move around in our lives. My mother recently passed away. And she had Parkinson's and several other ailments. And every time I picked up the phone with her, I called her, she picked up the phone. She would very quickly, she didn't even ask me how it's going. She would just say, so Hans Peter, where are the robots? And I'd say, you know, well, it'll be a little while, but they're coming. And she'd go, well, they better come soon. And with Parkinson's, you know, one of the things that happens is you lose something on the floor and you can't pick it up. Very simple things. You shuffle your feet and maybe kick over a, a carpet, which might in, the turn, in, in turn cause you to stumble later and fall. And these little things were big things for her. And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to solve the little things. The little things that make life smoother, better, easier. And for a wide range of people, a mother or father with three children. It could be a busy workplace, an older person in an institution or, or assisted living or even trying to live at home. So I envision a world where robots help us. We have many, many decades of Hollywood movies that help inform the way we feel about robots. And unfortunately, most of that narrative is um, based in fear, right? You've got the Terminators of the world. But it actually, I think there is an opportunity to rewrite that narrative and to actually create robots that can be as useful in our daily physical lives as computers have been in our digital lives. We're building robots that are going to live amongst us. And so we put a lot of effort into creating a group of people here who come from very different walks of life. And they ask different kinds of questions. We need anthropologists, we need philosophers, we need linguistics people, we need bioengineers, we need choreographers. We've moved from a space where robots are going to be out in the real world and in the wild, and they're going to be moving alongside people. And the people who are true experts in how to create those movements, those really are choreographers. There are people that, when we first brought Katie in, that would come up to me and say, what are you doing? Like, why didn't we just bring in another engineer? We don't waste our time, Denise. Typically with engineering, you have a very standard process that you're following in order to get good results. You've got your you know, requirements gathering, your architecture, your design, your reviews. But with Katie, it was very much this ambiguous, amorphous challenge of, you know, how do I collaborate with these robots? You have to be in your feelings more rather than in your data. Um, and a lot of us are not used to that. And she did a workshop early on on movement. And it was, this was back in COVID days, right? So everybody was on, on, on you know, Google video chat. And you had all these people who probably hadn't gotten up from their desk for days, right? It was early COVID, we were all sitting there. And they were starting to move around and there was music and they were doing stuff. And I was sitting there and I was going, yes, that's exactly what we need. That was really like the icebreaker of like, let's really get you out of your comfort zone and into this like creative thinking process. And then if I move, they should flock with me. In the flock, we have robots that are running a navigation algorithm, and that determines where all of the robots go in space. And we can flock this direction. Katie's such a unique person because, you know, she's a dancer, but she's also an engineer. She's now doing a PhD in robotics. And I felt like my sort of artistic skills had nothing to do with me being a roboticist, right? They felt like, Okay, here's my artistic life over here. It's really inspired my interest in robotics, but it doesn't provide value to my robotic skills. That was my initial impression. And I think since then, I've really found that the two are, are quite integral. And the way that I've really brought my dance and choreography training in to robotics is through human-robot interaction. One of my projects is about gesture. So for example, if I have a robot in my kitchen in the future and I have my family and they're really loud and raucous, maybe 
it's hard for the robot to hear me over all of that noise and shout a command to it. And so a movement-based interaction might be better. I've got a hand up gesture. So if the robot sees a hand up gesture, they all spin in place. So they perform an abstract version of a pirouette. There's a lot of uncertainty. OK, we've lost some of our robots. <laughs> and um, okay. being comfortable with uncertainty is part of the creative process. We actually celebrate failure, because it's like that Edison quote, I didn't fail, I just tried 10,000 things that don't work. And so every time we fail at something, we learn something. Oh, we lost this one, too. Failure is a tool. Okay. Failure is a modality. Oh, can we timestamp that? Failure is something you have to embrace as a part of the process. Innovation is never a straight line. Innovation is a bumpy ride, and you try a bunch of things. One of the things I learned was the arts in general and technology are really dance partners. And that, that ability to move fluidly between the questions and the challenges posed by art and the need for certainty and definition and clarity, which is the quest of building technology, was just a perfect push-pull yin-yang in terms of dance. The dance of these two forces, opposing forces, ultimately can create something really beautiful.